Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to examine human environment interactions. We're going to be examining the complex relationships between humans and the natural environment we inhabit because it's a two-way interaction. Different cultural groups will interact or use the physical landscape in a variety of different ways. They may clear forested areas for agriculture or for cities. They may protect the forest for economic, social, or political reasons. The reality is that different cultural groups utilize the physical environment in many different ways. So we're going to start by examining some theories regarding human environmental interaction. And we'll start with environmental determinism, which is the view that the natural environment has a controlling influence over various aspects of human life, including cultural development. Essentially, what this theory means is that humans are clay and they're molded by the environment. It was especially prominent in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but has largely been discredited, as we'll talk about shortly. But it does explain, for example, how a region's climate and soil fertility can dictate many choices that a society makes. The key takeaway is that the environment determines or use whatever synonym you want. The environment controls. The environment exclusively shapes. It doesn't matter. The environment does it alone. On the flip side, however, possibilism is the theory that the physical environment may set limits on human actions, but people have the ability to adjust to the physical environment and choose a course of action from many alternatives. Notice that all of our key words suggest possibilities. People have opportunities based on what the physical environment provides. For example, if people don't have enough water for their crops, they can divert rivers or build dams to provide irrigation. Let's get some visual help. So on the top, we have environmental determinism. There is no flexibility. There are no options. The physical environment is the sole force in shaping human culture, according to this theory. On the bottom, we have the theory of possibilism, which argues that the environment sets limits that offers possibilities, and different cultures may develop as a result. Please make the note. Environmental determinism believes that the environment determines. But with the theory of possibilism, there are possibilities. And because both environmental determinism and possibilism are theories about how humans and the environment interact, there are also criticisms that both schools of thought face. Critics of environmental determinism argue that it overemphasizes the role of the environment by stating that humans are passive pieces to be controlled by the physical environment. A more prominent criticism, and the reason it's been largely discredited, is that this theory was used to argue that certain regions were superior and others inferior. And because physical environment causes culture, there were certain cultures that were superior and others that were inferior. This ethnocentric approach made the argument that the most productive regions were the temperate ones. But when you look at the hurts of civilization, where civilization originated, the temperate regions were not what environmental determinists claimed they were. Possibilism has its share of critics as well. First off, it doesn't completely disprove the influence that environment has on human culture. While the limits are more broad, there are still limits. 
And finally, and perhaps most importantly, for discussions that we will have in the future, there's an argument that humans' ability to overcome the limits set by the environment is based on the available technology and their ability to afford that technology. Imagine if you lived in the Las Vegas Valley without air conditioning. We've developed technology that allows us to live comfortably in an area that has extreme temperatures and very little rainfall. But that is based on your ability to afford air conditioning and the higher energy bills that go with it. Other people who are unable to afford that technology may struggle to overcome the limits that the natural environment sets and may live very different lives than individuals who can afford that technology. So let's move out of the theoretical realm of human environment interaction and into how it manifests itself in reality. We know that human environment interaction is a two-way street. The environment impacts humans and humans impact the environment. One way in which humans have impacted the physical environment is through the use of natural resources. These are materials found in nature that can be used for economic gain. Things like minerals, forests, water, and fertile land. And they can generally be categorized into renewable or non-renewable resources. Non-renewable resources have limited quantities, and people consume it faster than nature produces it. Resources like coal, oil, and natural gas, which are often called fossil fuels, are non-renewable. Renewable resources are plentiful, and nature produces it faster than people consume it. The sun, wind, water, and the Earth's interior can be utilized as renewable resources. One source that falls into both camps is nuclear energy, which uses natural resources that aren't renewable, but the energy produced is renewable. It's one of the safest and most cost-efficient types of energy without emitting greenhouse gases and requires less land than other forms of energy. And how land is used is another form of human environment interaction. As cities continue to grow, we are losing land that can be used to feed the growing population. But some cities have responded by building gardens and other green spaces on rooftops. Humans make the choice to dam up the natural flow of rivers or to build golf courses in the desert. We have reclaimed land from the sea in places like Louisiana, as well as the Netherlands. We make many choices how to use different physical landscapes to accomplish various objectives or needs. But if we can alter the landscape, can we protect it, preserve it? Sustainability is the belief that humans should use the Earth's land as well as its renewable and non-renewable resources in a way that they can will be available for future generations. The concept of sustainability is directly related to possibilism. If you envision environmental determinism again, it could be argued by an environmental determinist, how could we possibly protect something or harness anything? more than what the environment permits us to do. But one of the criticisms of possibilism was that the ability to access technology limits the possibilities. Green roofs, solar arrays, wind farms, and carbon capture technology already exist. But that technology is expensive. And as climate change continues to occur, the countries that may be the most impacted by it may struggle to afford the technologies to combat it. So sustainable development is a movement to improve the quality of life for individuals around the world without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. 
and geographers study sustainability in many different fields. We will discuss it throughout the year, from population to politics, agriculture to urbanization. How do human practices and choices in each of those fields impact the physical environment, both now and in the future? And that's where we will leave off tonight. Have a good evening, and I'll see you back in class.